Hello, this is my Bragg's fantasy scenario of Baron Victory. Uh, this is the union phase of the 1530 turn. Uh, you'll remember from the previous video, or perhaps you don't, that uh, the the army of uh, Army of Tennessee had some success in pushing the army of the Cumberland uh, back, uh, particularly Wilder's brigade, which is these three counters right here, was pushed back here, and Beatty's brigade was pushed off from, was forced to retreat from these two hex out to here, uh, and one counter in each of these two brigades was actually disorganized, so it'll take a couple turns for, for, for them to fully recover from that. Uh, and uh, so now we're, uh, but now we're in the union phase, uh, so let's first do our command phase and then we'll start talking about uh, movement and fire combat strategy for the union side. So first we have to do our command phase. We're going to issue new order. Let's see. So the first uh, first step is to issue new orders. Um, and I think I'm not going to issue new orders. Uh, I do have. I would like to get uh, Barnes's brigade uh, with A B uh, uh, fire level uh, on the offensive and attacking. Uh, this counter right here just to try to generate some pressure on this side of the line and hopefully uh, start to uh, infiltrate the right flank of the Army of Tennessee. Uh, but I, what I'm going to, the method I'm going to try to use, do that is this turn, I'm going to roll for initiative on Van Cleave to get him moving. Uh, these units here, all of these units currently, their standing order or their, you know, their current order is to defend in place. Uh, and so right now, uh, Barnes does not have authorization, or Van Cleve does not have authorization to send Barnes's brigade forward. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Van Cleve roll for initiative this turn, and then during the movement phase, I'm going to have Rosencrantz move up here and give Van Cleve an uh and, and the following turn, Rosencrantz can give Van Cleve an in-person order, uh, and by doing an in-person order, we can uh, increase the chance that Van Cleve will be able to accept that order immediately. So I'm not going to issue any new orders this turn. Uh, there's no core attack stoppage checks to make. Uh, for the Union. Uh, the Union is in a defensive role here. Uh, initiative, let's have Van Cleve roll for initiative. So his uh, leader rating is, is a 3. So where is our initiative chart? Oh, good. Where is the initiative chart? I know I actually know what it is we need to roll, but I was just I just assumed I could very easily find Oh, there it is right there. Okay. Uh so uh Van Cleve's leader rating is 3, so I need to roll a 10 or higher on a 2d6. And it did not get it. Rolled a nine. So we're done with the initiative phase. A uh, delay reduction. The union has one order in delay reduction. That is the order to twentieth corps. That that is in D one status. So uh, so uh, McCook will imp will implement or accept his order. Uh, uh, to to uh, well ex well execute or accept this order if if uh, if if our uh, order acceptance roll is a one or a two, that's a two d six roll. I'm sorry, that's a one d six roll. So we'll roll our combat die and focus on the blue dice. That's a one d six. And he rolled a one, so the order is accepted. That is huge. So. So, 
McCook and 20th Corps are going to start uh, executing their order to move 20th Corps HQ and and the 3rd Division of the 20th Corps north on the Lafayette Road to defend the road near the Brock Cabin. Uh, the HQ should rest at Hex 1215. Um, so that's this area right here. Hooking up with the rest of with the rest of 20th Corps here and here. So let's update our chart to show that that's accepted. <laughs> Oh, that was not what I wanted. Uh, so we've uh, done our delay reduction. Now we have a new, uh, we do have an acceptance roll to make this turn. Uh, that is uh, 21st Corps uh, order. The order to 21st Corps is arriving this turn, 1530. Uh, Crittenden is a one and, a Rosen, and Rosencrantz is one. Leader rating. So we've got 1 plus 1 equals 2. That is, let's just verify whether it's a oral or written order. It's a written complex order. So we have 2 plus 0 for written, uh, minus 2 for complex. So we're rolling on this column right here, rolling 2d6. Roll to seven, that's D1 status. So we'll update our order chart. And then on subsequent turns, uh, uh, Crittenden will need a one, a, a die roll of one or two uh, to accept the order. So we're through with our orders phase, or our command phase. Now we're at the movement and close combat phase. Uh, no stragglers. Let's see, this is the 1530 turn. So you recover stragglers on the turns that start at the top of the hour. Uh, so we're not, so the Union Army isn't eligible to uh, recover stragglers this turn. So I will not place any counters. Uh, so now we're at the movement and close combat phase. So there's a lot to decide right now. Um, I thought about this before I started the video. Uh, um, I'm def Remember, Negley has accepted orders to uh, move down here and defend the Lafayette Road but between the Brock House and uh, these crossroads right here, if I remember right. It's either these crossroads or these crossroads. Um, maybe it's these crossroads. Uh, and so we'll definitely have Negley, uh, uh, Negley's division uh, moving forward to carry out that order. Uh, we'll definitely want to reposition Beatty's brigade back along the line here in some fashion. Uh, we don't really want this unit to get fired on, or this counter to get fired on by the Confederate side because it's already disorganized. Uh, so there's a, so there's a, uh, if it were to get disorganized again in combat, and that's more likely than, than, uh, than, uh, um, than, uh, you know, a, a unit without a, uh, without an elevated morale level, because 
Um, it'll, I mean, in other words, it'll be now that it's already a disorganized, it will be easier for the unit to get disorganized in subsequent combat because it's starting out disorganized. And a second disorganized role would route uh, uh, this counter and, and force, and since th this is one unit, uh, 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 it would have to retreat significantly and pull this counter along with him off the Lafayette Road. So we'd rather not uh, get this half of Beatty's brigade uh, fired on if we can possibly avoid it. Um, of course, this unit is going to hold, and I, I believe I'm going to try something. Uh, well, uh, so, sorry, not up here. Uh, we're just going to have uh, King's, uh, Br King's uh, uh, brigade hold here. Um, there's a couple things we could do here um, with uh, Carlin's uh, brigade. It's bloodlusted, uh, which gives it, which is, enhances its ability to successfully close combat and force this unit back. Although Robinson's brigade is also uh, has a morale level, so it would take a, a really a strong morale result to uh, force. Uh, force him back, but that's one option. Another option is to detach, this is at A fire level, so another option is to detach a B level um, uh, detachment from this unit, move him here for two, move and, um, and then move him here for four. Uh, we, we, we can't go direct from here to here because we'd be moving from both of these are in our are Confederate zone of control, are in the Confederate zone of control, and so you can't move directly from one such hex to another one. But I can take the detachment, move it here for two points, uh, two because of the woods, and then two more for four here. And then at that point, I would have a flank fire on Bates's uh, brigade here, and that's mighty tempting. Uh, just to try to release release some of the pressure on King, uh, because King King will uh, will be wrecked uh, if if he suffers two more losses. Uh, so I would like to give some cover to King if I possibly can. So I think of the two options. I think I'd like the the detachment option a little bit better. Um, now it is a, it's a bit of a risk um, because. If you split your A level up into two, and and you and you take enough losses to drop down to B level, then essentially uh, one of the two counters will evaporate, and that could be a problem in terms of maintaining a line. Uh, but I think it's a it's a it's a good risk to take this turn. Um, and then the other question is, question is what to do with Wilder's brigade. Uh, remember that the Union was trying to do everything it could to prevent the Confederate artillery from moving up into these hexes and thereby allowing them to fire on the uh, uh, on the Union line. Uh, so one thing I could do is I could try to, as the Union player this turn, is I could try to perpetuate that strategy by, uh, oh, and one thing I didn't do on the previous turn that I'll take care of now is, is uh, Heg's brigade is knocked down to a fire level, and I neglected to uh, remove this, so I'm going to remove it now. Uh, I could detach a B counter from here, just like as I was talking about from uh, uh, Carlin's brigade up here, detach a B, go here, here to 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 get um, a Union uh, uh, some Union uh, infantry into this hex, and then move these two counters here and here. Uh, with this one trailing behind. Remember, since these three counters form one unit, they have to stay contiguous like this. They can't, uh, they have to, at each of the two counters, each counter has to uh, be contiguous to another a counter in the brigade. Uh, so long story short, I could put Union, uh, Union artil or Infantry here, 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 uh, to try to again prevent that um, that movement of artillery up, but 
one problem with it uh, is that uh, this uh, Uh, this component of Gracie's brigade would not be an enemy zone of control, and so it could move up um, uh, potentially and cause problems there. Although now that uh, Sheridan's division is going to be moving up, I, you, you know, the Union player will have to think carefully about how they're going to handle that situation uh, to avoid getting flanked themselves. Um, so the, the strategy I, saw, I outlined is one possibility, but I think what I'm going to do is be a little bit more conservative than that and just try to maintain a line, uh, along these, uh, uh, along these hexes here, um, possible, uh, well, uh, an element of this, uh, a rule I haven't discussed yet is that when a, when a, when a, uh, a unit is, disorganized, it only gets half its normal movement points. So I think in terms of movement, the best I could do for this unit would be one to here and then two more to here. That's three movement points, half of its normal six. Uh, and it's two from here to here because one for the hex and one for the stream. So I um, now you might be asking, why don't I move this artillery up? Uh, I, and I could do that. I had, it would have enough movement points to do it. It could, uh, limber for three, move here for one, for four, and then unlimber for three more, seven. Seven is its, um, allotted, is the allotted number of movement points it has. But the problem with that is whenever, uh, artillery unlimbers within two hexes, of the enemy, and of course there's line of sight, uh, it draws fire from, from any such hex. And so it would draw fire from this hex, this hex, this hex, this hex, this hex, this hex. So that would be uh, two, four, six, eight. It would get 10 fire points. Uh, it would receive 10 f uh, fire points of fire if it uh, unlimbered in this hex. Uh, and that that's a sure loss of, and, and and it only has two uh, strength points to begin with uh, and if you uh, with 10 string with 10 uh, fire points it's there's a, a loss of one for sure and a pretty good chance it, uh, of losing both of the string points due to the uh, the opportunity fire so I'm not going to move this artillery forward so what I'm going to plan on doing here is just moving uh, these two components of Wilder's division and two here and here, move this, move this one here and, um, and hopefully be, be able to, uh, hold the line for another turn, uh, without suffering, without suffering too many casualties this turn during, or yeah, this turn, um, because, uh, well, except for this hex, the, uh, this unit, the unit that's here won't be, will be two hexes away from the Confederate units instead of one and therefore draw less firepower. Um, so that's the way I'm going to play this. Uh, so let's start doing our movements. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move this unit two, four, to try to protect King's left flank, uh, and, and, uh, provide at least, you know, more pressure on these two Confederate brigades here. And then I'm going to move this disorganized, it, ha it has to end up contiguous to uh, this counter here. So I'm going to go and it only has three movement points, so I can go one to here because this is officially a clear hex because less than half of it is covered up by woods. So I can go one, two, three there, and then get some infantry on top of that art that artillery, so uh, so it's not uh, thereby uh, exposed to uh, 
uh, Confederate uh, infantry fire. Um, now let's move Negley. So one of Negley's brigades is already uh, in line, and the rest of it of, of the of the of the division is in column. So, um, and one thing I should say is since Negley has divisional goals, he does not have to stack with one of his uh, one of his brigades. And I do believe I specified uh, a hex for Negley to rest in in my order. So let's go back and check that. Whoops, that's not what I want. Oh, let's see. I did not specify a spot for Negley to rest. Okay. So, here I'm just going to move Negley off there for a second. So, I'm going to go one. Huh? One, two, oh, and then I should move him back. Um, uh, remember, the command radius is four, but I can use the road. Uh, I see what I can do. I can go one, two, th three, four. Let's see, it's one, two, two and a half command points to there. Um, so as long as, you know, I can keep this, this line of command, so to speak, free of Confederate zones of control, uh, uh, Sir Wells' brigade is meeting his command radius. Um, and let's see, this unit can move, the artillery can move one. Let's see, and how many are in there? I think that's a five, uh, five art artillery strength points. Uh, so I could even stack them there. Um, let's see, I can go one, two, three, and then I am not within, this unit here is not within two hexes of any Confederate infantry unit or artillery unit uh, with line of sight uh, so I can use my remaining movement points to unlimber. And I'm going to stack him below the infantry. Now because of the uh, fire limits out of uh, the rules for the fire limits coming out of a single hex, I've got seven artillery points here, but I can only fire five out of the hex, but that's okay for now. Um, um, this could make a big difference here. Um, and then I need to move the rest of Negley's division. So one, two, I think I'm going to require the infantry to move to column at the Brock House or close to it. So, oh wait, I know what I'm going to do. Um, two, so, so I've used two movement points. One, to two and a half movement points. One, two, three movement points. Um, I can now unlimber. Here, I'm going to move these. I'll just, just ignore the cavalry for now. Um, 
I can now put him in line for with my remaining movement points. And then now this brigade is at A, B level. So I will put that there. Just leave it like that for now and delete him. And we'll just kind of do the same here, maybe. One, two, three. Oh, no, no, you can't do it that way. Maybe I can only... One, two, yeah. So he moves here. He moves here. This probably isn't the most efficient way of doing this, but for the remaining movement points, we'll put him into line as well. Elevate him to AB and just leave him there for now. So let me just make sure then, yes, I'm meeting all my command radius requirements. Um, the cavalry has been here since the beginning. I never know what to do with, or very rarely know what to do with cavalry, especially small cavalry units. I suppose, I suppose I could send him down here to protect a flank. That may not be a bad idea, actually. Uh, we'll make a decision about that after I finish m moving my other units. Um, so... Now maybe I should think about something. This unit has orders to defend in place two. Is it consistent with that order to do what I suggested and send a detachment out to uh, to place in a, a detachment here to fire here? I'm going to say that it is. I think that's consistent with the idea of defending in place. I'm not, I mean, maybe it's a little bit of a stretch, but I, th I think a, uh, well, that's a good question. You know, the more I think about it, the more I think it's the kind of thing that actually should be handled via initiative in this situation. Uh, so I'm not going to do what I said, what I suggested I would do. Um, am I... Am I contributing to my ability to defend in place by doing a detachment and then attacking Bates Brigade? Um, it might be one thing if, if Bates was focused on me, but he isn't. Um, and so maybe my defend in place orders require me to uh, not do that. I think, I think actually I will not weaken myself in this position, um, but I will, uh, I will not send a, a detachment towards bait. Um, now, I th I do think it would be allowable for me to, now that I'm bloodlusted, to directly tack the enemy brigade that's attacking me, that would be consistent with defending in place because sometimes, you know, that is the best defense is to, uh, is to try, try to drive them off when you have a good opportunity to do so. Um, and then if I were actually able to do it, then 
uh, one of the situations where you're allowed to make a facing change is after a close combat. So if I can successfully push Robertson out of this hex and take this hex as part of close combat, then I would be allowed to change my facing and get a flank shot on Benning's uh, brigade here. Um, now one thing I should do is let me check Carlin's current strength level. Uh, Carlin is actually uh, in good shape. He's got take five hits and still remain at a fire level. Um, so if I ever, I think, ever were to want to do a close combat here, this would be the turn. So I think I'm going to go ahead and do that. So uh, now I won't be able to take the artillery with me, um, but, uh, but I think we're going to give it a shot. So I will... Uh, let's, let's go. So we move into the hex, and that costs three, two for the hex, and then one for the close combat. Uh, so first we're just going to do our, our losses without rolling for morale. And both sides are at A fire level, so both sides will roll on the th three to four column. Uh, first we have to do fire points, uh, so we're at close combat uh, A, so uh, eight. Uh, so each side will be firing with eight, uh, not four, but eight uh, fire points at each other. Uh, so I was wrong when I said before. So actually we're going to be on this column here. So first we'll roll for... Uh, First we'll roll. Uh, first we'll roll defensive, but losses are simultaneous. So, uh, so the so th this roll here will not affect. Well, uh, the roll by the uh, Confederate will not affect the strength points with which the uh, Union fires at. So we're just going to do two independent rolls here. So let's roll our combat die. Well, rolled a ten. That's a really good roll. So. Uh, two permanent losses on the Union. Uh, rounding dice is irrelevant. And straggler roll a five. Uh, the Union unit has C-level morale. Sorry. So let's see, we're on this table here. Five. So two losses and two stragglers. Hmm. That this might not have been a good idea <coughs> by Carlin. So let's do our two losses and two stragglers on Carlin. We're not going to roll for morale yet. Now the Union will roll on Robertson. 11. <laughs> That's a roll of two and, but, uh, Carlin gets a low ammo result. So let's do that, take care of that. Uh, Uh, that goes here. I'm just going to put this off to the side for the moment. So, rolled an 11, so that's two permanent, and a straggler roll of four with A morale. So, two permanent, one straggler. On the on Robertson, a 
let's see, Robertson, uh, there he is, so, so two permanent, ooh, that takes him down to B fire level. Oh, no, it doesn't. One short of beef. Oh, come on. Boy, I'm having trouble getting this centered. Okay. So we finished the fire combat portion. Now... And now we do the morale. So first, the... The attacker takes a morale check at minus six level, uh, but it is bloodlusted. Actually, so, um, so well, we do still roll, but we roll on the bloodlust morale check. Roll the 52, so he's no longer bloodlusted. So we just remove the counter. That's the only effect. Uh, and now we do the same at a minus four level for the defender. 32. So now one, two, th that's going to be a no effect. 32 is no effect. Uh, so both sides pass their morale check in the close combat. And so now we have to go to the close combat chart, which is here. And this can be kind of conf confusing. So we've got a fire level in both cases. So it's a one to one, so four to four or one to one. So we're on this table here. Uh, let me just check the uh, modifiers. N neither the uh, attacker or defender is wrecked, uh, so there's no modifiers. So we just roll on this uh, 1d6 on this column here. So we'll be paying attention to the blue dice here because it's a 1d6. Roll a 4 uh, and the Carlin is thrown back. So that's the end of the close combat. Carlin did not achieve his objective. So Carlin is done with movement. Um, I'm going to leave Hag unmoved. I'm going to move, well, let's see, now that we've got Sirwell here, with artillery, I think I've got a different plan for Wilder's Brigade. I'm going to move Wilder's Brigade. See, this is A, and this is B. And I'll have six movement points, but I have to get. this counter contiguous with one of these other ones. So I think what I can do, I think what, I don't know that it really matters that much. I'm going to move the A here, two movement points. This is two, three movement points here. And then, he's use two movement points to move here. Um, and I'm throwing, let's see, now we have to think about facing. So I want, so I've got Wilder's Brigade facing, well, this this counter facing in, in the in the direction I want to 
unless I want to spin him. Um, no, I don't want to spin him. I, I want to leave him as he is. And so we'll just stipulate, it. well here, we can actually, I'll rotate him one, but we'll stipulate that uh, the, the, uh, the extended line is, uh, is has this you know the same direction of facing so these will be the three frontal hex sides of this counter now i think technically speaking i'm breaking a rule in that i've got the extended line at a and at a fire level and the the mother counter as it, as it were at b fire level uh but that's a rule i i tend to not pay attention to too much uh in this game uh it's just kind of the way things played out, so, so I'm just going to leave it as it is. Um, let me just, before I move on, just give myself one more chance to take that move back. And just, just make sure I'm not doing anything stupid. I do have zones of control into these two hexes, so um, so no one would be able, so the Confederate, Confederate Army would not be able to get a a unit into this hex, um, and I do have line of fire here, here, not to here, here obviously, okay. Yeah, I think I'm going to leave it like that. Uh, and then my one remaining move will be to move 20th core. Um, and they're in line already. I. I'm not going to flip them into column. Uh, I'm just going to move them one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. What else? What's here? Oh, there's one more brigade. Let's move the brigades first. Did I not do that right? Oh, we'll move them there. Uh, oh, and this is a B. Um, and then there is five units of artillery here. So artillery will unlimber, well, it has to unlimber to move. So three, four, five, six. Actually, I, I don't think I'm allowed to use the road rate unless I, um, unless it occupies its own hex. Um, so let's move Sheridan now up to here and 20th core just to here and I think we're good there so next turn 20th core can definitely get involved with things which makes things for the Confederate side even more urgent so that's all the movement I will do as the Union player so now we're going to switch to the uh, fire combat phase. Uh, no, uh, oh, there's no ammo resupp. There are no low ammo markers on the Union side, so there's no. Oh, there's a low ammo marker here for the Confederacy that needs to go there. Oh wait, or did it go here? Actually, I, no, I'm sorry, it went on Carlin, actually. So there actually, so there is a low ammo marker. <laughs> uh, this is, Carlin's in the 20th core. Where is the, well, one option, oh, the 20th core, and the 20th core uh, uh, supply wagon is down here. But Rosencrantz, oh, another move I wanted to make before I forget is 
Rosencrantz. Well, see, well, my plan was... We're still in the movement phase. Um, my thought was... Uh, I wanted to move Rosencrantz here so we could give Van Cleve an in-person order next turn. But then can I send the... Army of the Cumberland Supply Wagon. I think I can. I'm going to say that I can. So Rosencrantz, I will move to Van Cleve. It's easily done with uh, with 10 leader movement points. And then I will send the Army of the Cumberland Supply Train. Let me check how many movement points they're entitled to. Where is, oh, train effects chart is here. Get six movement points. I take it those are just normal, like, infantry movement points. So one, three, four, five, six to here. Um, and then next turn, we should be able to uh, uh, get the supply wagon close enough that, uh, well, we'll have to see whether we want to do that or not, because uh, we don't want to bring the, we, normally we wouldn't, I mean, we're just playing a little scenario here, but normally we would not bring the Army of the Cumberland supply train uh, close to combat and it would be getting pretty close here so we'll have to see how things play out next turn uh, but we've taken some steps towards getting Carlin resupplied and so now we're done with the movement phase and so now we will switch to the fire combat phase so what I think I'll do is I'll just do the uh, actually this video has been going a long time already so I will stop the video at this point and in my next video, I will do the fire combat phase and the remainder of the turn for both the non-phasing player and the phasing player. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.